that you enjoyed your lunch. Coffee is not going to be served here, so I imagine it has been served for you, so you are all alert. We have the pleasure this afternoon, this uh, third session, the uh, title of which is Jewish Experience of Persecution. Um, I have three lecturers. I will introduce one by one. They will have 20 minutes each, I was told. Um, I'll try to be democratic. Remember, democracy in, in dictatura has the same D, starting with that. So I'll try to be as democratic as possible and keep you to 20 minutes so that the people who have taken this time to come in this heat, they will have the chance, the opportunity to be able to ask questions. Uh, the first speaker will be Hen Bram. Hen Bram is an anthropologist and educationalist with additional training in orga organizational studies, sociology, and comparative religion. Currently, he is a research fellow at the Truman Institute at the Hebrew University. Huh? He also teaches at the... That's what I have. Cannot change the text. He also teaches at the Israel Studies Graduate Program of the Rothberg International School and the School of Education at the Hebrew University. Combining his academic interests with practical applications, he worked as an, and engage, uh, as an engaged and applied anthropologist. Bram conducted field work in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, Israel, and among post-Soviet immigrant communities in New York City. Bram served as academic manager of the research group called Anthropological Knowledge, Relevance, Use, and Potential. Uh, this, was, this group is at the Van Leer Institute and as a visiting professor at the University of Florida and at James Madison College of Public Affairs, MSU. Recently, he was a research fellow at the International Research Institute at the Yad Vashem. So I will call upon Professor Bram, who will talk to us today on memory and commemoration, the divided Holocaust experience of Caucasus Mountain Jews. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon. typical to lectures on the Caucasus. The Caucasus <laughs> somehow, if you want to find a, a map of the Caucasus, you will find half a map in the Middle East, half a map or one, one quarter in Europe and one quarter in Central Asia. So hence, I'm uh, really thankful for the organizers who uh, included my, uh, uh, my paper on the Caucasus. At the same time, I also feel a little bit awkward. I feel a little bit awkward because somehow I thought from the uh, call for proposals that, that there will be a panel on memory and commemoration. And uh, I said, okay, I'll take the, uh, let's be on a safe path. If I'll, if I'll suggest something historical about the Caucasus, which is my, uh, related to my work in Yad Vashem, Maybe people will say, oh, it's not Middle East Jews. So, let's suggest something about commemoration. But then I find myself, as happened a lot to anthropologists, only with historical, very historical accounts, while I'm actually talking about, let's say, I'm talking about history, but through the lens of memory and commemora uh, 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 commemorating the Holocaust among uh, uh, Caucasus Jews. And you can see the Caucasus here in, um, uh, uh, in the middle. Um, <coughs> so, one minute. Let's see. 
Okay. So, um, as Israeli national discourse has only began addressing the meanings of the uh, various experiences of Ashkenazi and Sephardi Mizrahi Jews during World War II, the experience of Caucasus Jews does not fit this categorization. It differs from both and at the same time combined. So you can see the Caucasus here and you can see that this is one of the most heterogeneous uh, areas in, in the world. And um, I'm, I'm speaking about a specific group in the Caucasus. If you want the um, Aboriginal Jews of the Caucasus, not the Ashkenazi Jews of the Caucasus. Okay, and there were other groups as well. I'm talking about the group who call the people who call themselves Juhuru, simply Jews. Uh, they had their own language, Juhuri or Judeotat. They were multilingual. Um, in the last generations, they moved gradually to Russian and in some areas to Azeri. And today, most of them are moving very quickly to Hebrew. And uh, you can see some numbers. Uh, today we are talking about around 130,000 people in Israel, not including the veteran immigrants from the Caucasus in the first, second, third uh, uh, immi uh, aliot immigra immigration to uh, Israel. And you can see here, it's a bit dark. Okay. You can see here that the Jews live in areas scared scattered all the way from Azerbaijan here up to Darastan, Chechnya, and then uh, kabardino balkaria the Cherkess areas, and furthermore to Piatigorsk and the uh, uh, Stavropol Krai are uh, under direct Russian rule. So this is a very diverse uh, uh, group and it's important to my uh, 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 lecture. So if we are... Ah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so if we are talking about memory and commemoration in Israel, um, probably most of you are familiar, familiar with the basic stages and tensions in Israel, a, a memory and commemoration culture, um, stressing the heroic resistance in the very beginning, uh, but then more and more focus also on everyday survival. Um, uh, sanctification of martyr's death or sanctification of life and rescue um, um, and, and so on. Uh, what I want to show you is that the immigrant's experience, this specific immigrant experience regarding commemoration and memory of the uh, Holocaust in the new surrounding um, shed actually a different light on these transformations and issues of uh, memory and commemoration uh, in, in Israel. And sometimes even, um, let's say, um, opposite a mirror. Um, so, uh, what I will try, oh, maybe before, I want to start with one, uh, uh, with one story, some voices from the fields. Anthropologists like to start with some voices from the fields. And this is a story of Marina. Uh, and this story happened in 2005. Her son was uh, in 11th grade and his school went to Poland in one of these journeys. Uh, this gave her motivation to go and um, she became part of um, um, a guiding course for the merch of the living. But then when she came to the course, she found herself with a uh, people from different uh, areas uh, stressing the um, um, uh, groups from, um, uh, for her, Russian-speaking groups. But then she had very hard experiences when uh, um, someone, Russian in origin, asked her, Are you a mountain Jew? Vygotsky uh, uh, And she said yes. And normally she, she told me she's not coming up front with her... Um, uh, origin because the feeling is that in many places of work in Israel, in concentrations of Caucasus Jews, if you are stressing that you are Kavkazi, you will stay outside. Okay, simply as can be. Um, um, or to put it in a slogan, uh, we are talking about the 1950s during the 1990s and even the 2000s. 
And, um, and, and she said, yes. So we said, what are you doing here? This is not at all connected to you. So I want to start with this frustration of this lady, and it went on, but I think it's, it's enough as, 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 a, as a beginning. Um, <coughs> and my aim in this paper is the discu to discuss the development of the memory of Holocaust among Caucasus Jews. I will show how the memory of the Holocaust and World War II and different commemoration projects were influenced by two main factors. First, the marginalization of the group, especially in Israel. Um, and second, the very different experience that various groups of Caucasus Jews faced during uh, World War II. Uh, furthermore, uh, I will argue that the experience of Caucasus Jews challenged the taken for granted binary ethnic categorization which divide Israeli Jews according to their Ashkenazi or Mizrahi origins. Okay, so, um, sorry. Okay, so what I will try to do, I will speak a little bit about the background, but then I will, I, I will speak about, I will do some analytic, uh, analytical division between four spheres of memory and commemoration. Extermination, the experience of the veterans fighting the Nazi, survival and the role of a uh, local Muslim population, and the, oh, I missed a word here, the Holocaust survivors. Okay, this is the last one, the Holocaust survivors. <laughs> now, um, you can see here the Germans advance uh, to, to the, the Caucasus between uh, June and November 1942, and uh, generally speaking, the Germans stayed in the Caucasus about four months, in some areas about two and a half months. It's not a lot compared to other areas, but this was enough to give a traumatic experience to a uh, uh, Caucasus Jews. Um, okay, and you can see here different sites of killing, mass killing. Most of them were Ashkenazi Jews who were in the Caucasus. Russian Jews uh, following evacuation or um, uh, also refugees from Poland, East Europe, and I recommend the, the, the new book by Kirill Pfefferman who discussed this in, in length. Um, and you can see one of the ditches um, for this uh, uh, mass, uh, uh, mass murders. The fate of Caucasus Jews, however, was different in different locations. In all these locations in red, Caucasus Jews were murdered in the same technique, simply like Ashkenazi Jews, hundreds of them in uh, Kolkhoz Bogdanovka, Kolkhoz uh, Menzhinsk, and other places were gathered together, were shot, and were covered. Um, um, but in Alchik, Nalchik was the main concentration of Caucasus Jews in the ar area under the German occupation. In Nalchik, although some people died, most of the Jews survived. And they survived because they, uh, let's put it very short now, um, the local administration uh, put by the German um, um, assisted the Jews and uh, claimed that these are not uh, regular Jews, but a local mountain tribe. The Germans, from their side, and you can see the, 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 this German propaganda here in the right, wanted, um, um, they had a clear ethnic-oriented policy in the Caucasus, um, and they didn't want to, to get any tensions with the local uh, population. So most of the Jews in Nalchik uh, 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 survived, although they were um, under um, um, a forced labor, fear, everyday fear from death, uh, very hard conditions, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> so I, um, I, I just put here a little bit of the previous uh, uh, um, research, and of course Mordechai Altschuler is very important here, but I want to say at the same time that most of this research is not coming from the perspective of Caucasus Jews uh, themselves and not, so, not enough contextualized most of the time to understand the very uh, specific context of the Caucasus, both multi-ethnic and also colonialist, post-colonialist, because the issue here is not only the Soviet Union, but the Russian um, 
um, the Russian uh, colonization of the Caucasus in the 19th century, which actually was also um, um, followed by, um, um, I would say, if I'll take this recession, a dig a term by a genocide of local people. Um, so, um, I will not talk a lot about uh, methodology, but I will say simply that I'm, I'm working as an anthropologist with these groups for many, many years, shifting from academy then to more applied, engaged anthropology, and then back, hopefully, to a, a more academic uh, work. So, if we are uh, talking about the um, um, <coughs> different um, experiences, some of the first um, accounts of uh, Caucasus Jews in the Holocaust appeared in the beginning of the 80s. In 1983, a book by uh, Nisim Ilishayev, From the Caucasus to Jerusalem, and then uh, in 1984, um, 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 uh, uh, in 1984, another, uh, another book, The Captured of uh, uh, Shalman Esser, written by this guy who called himself Manoach, because, but this was not his, uh, he, his name is Boris Shalmiev, because when he printed this, he was afraid about his relatives in the Caucasus. Um, um, the motivation of Shalmiev is very interesting. He wrote his book um, uh, dealing with uh, the history of Caucasus Jews after I saw um, um, a newspaper report in a major Israeli newspaper talking about the Caucasian ghetto in Beersheba. So this is a clear, um, uh, let's say, uh, act of uh, let's show the, uh, uh, the Israeli society a different um, uh, face of Caucasus Jews uh, very different from their, I would say, extreme marginalization and negative stereotypes, especially in the 80s, but in some places even until, um, uh, until today. So uh, these writers are dealing especially with uh, extermination, and um, uh, although they also deal a little bit with heroes. Um, um, but the focus is on extermination, and here you can see... Um, a this is already a book printed in um, uh, 2004 by immigrants who arrived in the 90s. But he refers, or he actually takes almost the same, uh, the same text as Manoach. You can see the text. The text is Bogdanovka, Babiyar of Caucasus Jews. But then you can see a poem. And the poem goes like this. The memory is covered with grass. No one remembers. No one rings the bells. Maybe this Babi Yar is foreign? So this is the, the question um, that in 2004 um, um, Badalov uh, asked in his book uh, uh, Angina Me. You can see the, the book over there. Um, and of course he can ask the questions but actually the only people who read these books there's a tremendous um, amount of, of writing but most of it for Caucasus Jews themselves. Um, <coughs> so the next attempt of commemoration happened in um, um, uh, 2005 when again an immigrant from the 70s, Ariel Ishai, um, 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 succeeded to get some money from his employee Chevrat uh, Hashmal, the electricity company, and he erected this kind of uh, memorial in the cemetery of Hadera. In the cemetery of Hadera, of course, we can go back to the very first memorials in Israel, which happened also in cemeteries. Um, so, while this was the experience of the 70s, uh, in the 90s there is a shift. And the shift is going to um, um, veterans. And you can see here Sveta Roberman's book about memory in immigration. She is dealing with the, uh, uh, immig uh, the Soviet Im immigrants um, um, doing all these parades of immigrants. But at the same time, when uh, Roberman uh, arrived to Kiryat Yam, she found a, a complete split. The commemoration of Soviet uh, uh, veterans is only for... Russian Ashkenazi. Um, the same pattern 
you can see also here, this is a book uh, by Asa Kasher and another lady from a Russian origin, and I apologize for uh, not remembering now, and um, uh, published by the Latrun Armed Corps. But there is not even one um, Soviet Jew who is not Ashkenazi. Uh, and of course, there are many examples. For example, Shaltiel Abramov, Isai Elizarov were heroes of the Soviet Union. Actually, the percentage of heroes of the Soviet Union among this specific group is bigger than any other groups in the Soviet, uh, 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 in the Soviet Union. So this brought to a new um, a culture of commemoration, but actually this culture was also influenced by the developments of uh, um, culture of memory in Moscow and in Azerbaijan. And German Zakharyaev um, is very active in, this, in pushing this um, uh, veterans discourse, but it's interesting to see that on the one hand he is working to, the, to um, record and to publish about the veterans from Caucasus, but at the same time he also uh, initiated a new memory day in Israel already recognized by the parliament, by the Knesset, and this is the uh, Hebrew uh, calendar date of the Soviet Victory Day. Okay, um, and I have a lot of ethnography about, for example, doing a celebration for this day in the UN uh, Center in New York and so on. This is very different um, uh, from what you see, you find, for example, here, Moshe Yosefov, dear friend of mine, but someone who was born in Israel, and um, also in um, um, and his, he, what he writes, you can find reproduction in many um, uh, blogs today of Caucasus Jews. And I'll give you one example. Um, 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 they are talking about heroism, but I also talking, they are also saying that the mountain Jews were especially um, important in fighting against the Muslim pro-Nazi um, brigades. Uh, and he's coming with this uh, romantic approach in Dagestan. The youngsters of Caucasus Jews capture these Muslims everywhere on horses and fought against the, uh, the Muslim uh, uh, fascists. And I just need two more slides. But how do I get this? Okay. So... Um, <coughs> This is very different narrative from what, what happened in, 19, in, in 2004 after the uh, bloodshed in Beslan in North Caucasus when about um, uh, 385 people were killed by a terror attack. Following this attack, group of immigrants from the Caucasus and especially from the areas that were under Nazi um, um, regime uh, initiated a project to bring survivors. When they asked, why do you bring these survivors? The answer was, they helped us in the Caucasus. We should help them here. So there is a clear, I don't have enough time to discuss it, but there is a clear tension between um, an inner uh, discussion, especially among people who experienced the Nazi occupation about uh, Muslim assistance to Jews, and Muslim assistance to Jews took many variants, including many, many families, many families, let's say, who were um, uh, hide, hidden in villages, but at the same time, among the overall community, people who came from other areas in the Caucasus, or veterans, there is also this kind of anti-Muslim general, um, uh, general approach. And last, I have to finish, um, in 2012, after a long struggle, um, the High Court recognized the Jews of Nalchek and some other cities as um, um, survivors. Um, and um, it's interesting to see, you can see it here in a site of Circassians in Israel. This had, there was more interest among the Circassians in Israel, who came from the same region, than maybe among the general population. And last, um, the survivors. The survivors themselves, although today, in the last two years, they get some rents, they don't get any, their voice is not there. And many of them, and I came to, to uh, make interviews with these survivors, many of them were enthusiastic because they feel that their voice 
uh, as uh, regarding the Holocaust should be there. It's not only a question of rent, it's also a question of experience. And we have here, of course, a huge educational uh, potential. And of course, there's also a lot to study from academic point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. Dr. Brown, I am very happy that you kept to the time and uh, about really this fascinating subject.